My name is Richard Hinton, and with me is uh, Nuala Cowan. We're both with the Department of Geography at um, George Washington University. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about OSM in the classroom. And this is really a sort of follow up with what we presented last year in San Francisco when we talked about how we engage our students by using OSM and using them sort of as a captive audience to actually contribute to OSM. So we're going to talk a little about uh, how the workflow has changed a little bit, the work that we've been doing, and then what's, uh, when I pass it over to uh, Nuala, she'll continue that workflow and then talk about Teach OSM and where things are moving now. All right, so about four years ago, I guess it is, uh, Nuala originally started this with our intermediate GIS class and working with, um, with the notion that she wanted to include uh, OSM into the classroom. And it started with one class and one instructor. Um, fast forward to this past semester where we had four classes, um, the best part of 90 students and, um, and several instructors involved in, in uh, getting OSM into the classroom. And a lot of times, um, for our purposes, I mean, we like to work with a partner. And in most cases we have, it's been the American Red Cross, um, USAID in conjunction with the World Bank, in particular last semester was uh, the Open Cities Initiative. And like I said, we have a captive audience to, uh, when, with our students to actually sort of uh, really focus on a particular area. So ideally, we like to work with a partner, and our interest is in uh, disaster preparedness. So when we were working in uh, with the American Red Cross last year, or maybe it was the year before, we are looking in uh, Colombia and Indonesia, and again, the, the Red, American Red Cross were working with their counterparts in those countries to really flesh out and build up that geospatial infrastructure, which didn't currently exist. Uh, last year, we did a lot of work with uh, USAID and um, working in Kathmandu as part of the Open Cities Project. And, um, and of course, the HIU would provided the imagery for that. That really helped our students out. This year, we will be working with the Geo Center again at USAID and uh, looking in the Philippines. And then, an uh, interesting thing from last year. Uh, after our students had uh, gone through our exercise, we just finished the project with those students where we had mapped Colombia and Indonesia, then um, the hurricane, Hayun, came through the Philippines. So we actually set up shop and uh, lunchtime for that week. Uh, the Red Cross said, hey, can you bring some of your students in or advertise to your students that you're having sort of a mapping session going on for anybody who can come in, use the space, and actually contribute to um, OpenStreetMap and the aid for um, for the first responders. So we actually did that for a week and every day we had um, maybe nine to a dozen people come in and just use the lab space to log on and start contributing to OSM. Uh, Hayari Zimbabwe will be doing um, this summer because we'll be teaching this class uh, three times uh, this summer. Uh, sorry, we'll be teaching this introdu introduction to cartography twice and then the um, grad level will be taught once. So right now, um, we're teaching it, four, there'll be four classes involved this semester as well as the fall, and then in the summertime there'll be three classes uh, via online involving this, and we'll be doing the work in Zimbabwe. And this will include about upwards of 250 students throughout the whole year that we'll be doing, uh, introducing to OSM and having to contribute to this product. So it's, it's, it's good to have this sort of captive audience because it's, uh, it's a little different than, uh, than most things. So where are we going? As I mentioned, this is like the sort of fourth iteration of bringing this into the classroom. And we're, since the beginning, the workflow has sort of changed. Um, trying to find ways to streamline it, technology has changed some. And so this year marks the first year when we're trying to actually sort of really uh, follow the same workflow that we had last year. Because it really worked last year. It was entirely open source. Previous years, we had to use a couple of different pieces of software. Um, that we had to download, be it Quantum, ArcGIS, whatnot. But last year it was all online, and it uh, worked fairly well. Um, the nice thing with the tools and the way the workflow um, is at this point, which we'll go through in the next few slides, is that enables us to not only include more students, but enables us, since we're assigning it as a, uh, as a homework, that it enables us to actually grade it and get a, the, the information back to the students in a timely manner. So. With the change in the technology and the tools that, can we, that we can use in our workflow, it enables us to really sort of grow, um, grow it at our department. So how is OSM actually sort of different uh, when you bring it to the classroom? Because obviously most people, when they contribute to OSM, they log in at a, at a hackathon or at a mapathon or at home and they start contributing it some, in some location that is of interest to them or something on the hot jobs that they've seen listed. But bringing it into the classroom, obviously, 
we need to um, make it equitable. All right, because every student needs to get a similar amount of work, and we need to be able to grade it and whatnot. So there are a lot of considerations here that we need to sort of think about when we actually want to bring it into the classroom and actually have students work on it. So as I was mentioned, we need to have it uh, an equitable volume of work for every student. Um, when we're, when we're looking at the area, one of the things we need to do is, or when we choose an area, we need to look at the area itself. What imagery is available? Um, how much canopy cover? How clear are the images? How accessible is it to our students? Because in our situation, we're having um, a lot of first year students, or at least newbies to the idea of geomatics. Where our introduction to cartography and GIS class, these guys have never really created maps before or looked at it, sort of geospatial information. So we had to make sure it's digestible for these guys and the tools are available for them to really contribute well. Um, so when we look at this information, we've got to see, all right, make sure the imagery is, uh, is, is, is well appointed so we can sort of identify what area is high density, which area is low density. Um, because if I give you five sort of grid cells uh, to work on, you're all high density versus these guys over here, which are all low density, it's not very equitable. So we need to actually look out, uh, look at, sorry, the area the, the, um, that we're going to be mapping. Um, and I was mentioning these grid cells and whatnot. Do we use a grid? Do we put a grid? Use tasking manage, which we'll mention in a moment, and actually divide the sort of geographic area we're interested in into a bunch of grids and assign people grids, in which case the idea of high density and low density really comes into play. Or do we simply just say, all right, this is our area that we're working. Um, instead of giving you a specific area, I'm going to say, all right, you have to create 150 buildings or 150 pieces of, pieces of infrastructure. All right, do you give them a quota to meet or do you give them grid cells or do you give them sometimes a bit of both? Um, we also need to find a way to track um, who does what? Because obviously we need to, to apply a grade, and we need to identify exactly who's done what work and how much work they've done. Um, one of the problems, of course, with um, with having a mass uh, assignment like this is that all of a sudden we have, like, say, in this case, we're going to have this year 100 students working on this uh, assignment in basically the same geographic area over the course of about two weeks. So we want to prevent overlap as best we can, because we can't have 15 students digitizing or tracing the same features and then you're going to have a lot of reconciliation issues obviously when you try to, when you try to commit those, um, those, those edits. Um, so we need to um, find a way to deal with that and testing managers is what we use for that and it's, it's a very valuable tool and so students essentially will sign out a, ta a, a grid that they'll actually work on and then we actually have to figure out alright how we're going to grade this and again this has changed over the last uh, few years and this past year we came up with a uh, rubric which we'll show you here very shortly. So the first thing that needs to happen as you want to, if you want to set this up and bring it into the classroom, the instructor needs to get prepared. So the first thing we do is identify an area of interest. And as I mentioned at the top, we would like to do this with, um, with one of the aid agencies uh, that we've become familiar with, uh, like say American Red Cross and the Geo Center at USAID are the two that we've worked with primarily. And it makes it that part of the job easy for us because for us we don't really care where we map, but we would like it to actually matter. And it also helps the students to um, sort of get engaged if it, they realize that this is for a particular project. So when we when the area is identified, obviously we want to become familiar with the area. We need to identify what is the area like, where are we mapping, how much the um, how much work is going to take, how much is uh, where's the high density, where are the low density um, areas. And then we need to sort of generate a workable grid. And again, Tasking Manager comes in very handy with this. We'll outline our area of interest in Tasking Manager. And then Tasking Manager will actually um, divide up the area into equal size squares, essentially. So then we can know what's in each square, what's in each, what is in each tile. And then we just need to decide on how much work we want to give our students. Last year, or last semester rather, we had our students do um, 150 buildings or 150 features. And if there was a road, then we told them that, all right, it had to be at least four nodes on a, on a road. And we also tell them as they're working through their area, uh, working through their um, study area, that if you see mistakes, things that are obvious, roads that are incorrectly traced, or buildings that are wrong, if you have a building going, a road going through a building or something, then fix it. So as you go through, fix it. And for every five or six notes, I think it was, that they sort of fixed, then we would give them credit for that as well. This year, we thought 150 was a little light. We also added um, extra credit if they did extra digitizing, and 90%, 95% of the students all took, took advantage of that to give you extra credit for a little extra tracing. Um, this year, we're going to bump it up to 200 uh, as, a, as a number of features. And again, if you do a road, we're going to say digitize at least five uh, nodes for a road. And uh, or digitize a building. 
You can also do, um, but that's a, a quota based if you wanted to, you can also obviously do both. You can have them assign them a particular tile at a tasking manager, a particular cell, and say, okay, you're responsible for this entire cell. If you do not reach your quota, uh, that's fine. If you, if, you, if you haven't reached your quota and you've done your cell, then you move on to a neighboring cell. Okay, so there's different ways you can work it, depending on how you want to do it. Uh, but to grade it, uh, as I was mentioning just previously, we need to develop a rubric, a rubric to identify um, how we actually going to mark this thing and let the students know, of course, as well, how we're going to do that. So we have this rubric that we came up with last year, and everything is um, sort of weighted based on how much they have completed. If they've done the entire quota, then that percent complete gets marked as 100. And then we actually want to assess the quality, how good are digitizing, because again, we want to make sure people aren't just banging in four squares for every building they see, even though it may, it may not actually accurately depict um, the footprint for that building and make sure the roads are actually on the street center lines as best they can. But two other things we wanted to uh, harp on the students about is the coverage and the sticking to task. Basically that means if they sign out a cell, they want to, we want to make sure they do everything possible that they can see in that cell. Because what we want to avoid are people sort of cherry picking on the periphery and so they only do sort of easy uh, tracing items. And then the problem with that is that it leaves these gaps of areas that should be traced that aren't. All right, so we're trying to get people to say, right, you take out that task, you take that particular cell, exhaust that cell, digitize, trace every feature you can possible in that particular cell, then move to somewhere nearby. Don't move to the other side of the uh, study area, stick to that area. So we want them to sort of really exhaust that particular piece of geography as best they can. And so they, we let them know this and we show them you get graded on this. So if we see that you are sort of cherry picking all over uh, the place, great, and we're glad you're doing the quota, but we want you to focus on little pieces of geography so we can actually exhaust that, so we don't have these gaps um, over the data set once we've completed the project. The next part, once the um, instructor is up and ready, we want to engage the students. So we sort of introduce them to what OpenStreetMap is, and um, a big part of that and getting them excited for, the, um, for this project is actually having one of our sort of partners come in. And our partners have been very generous with their time. Um, coming in last year, uh, the guys from USAID came in and talked to the students. Because this is different from any other assignment that they'll do, most likely. This is where we're actually, your work, when you create this information, it goes live. And everybody, anybody in the world can now see it. Um, in conjunction with that, you're working as part of a larger larger group and a larger project. And uh, as, um, yeah, all right, we're running each other off time. Last year we went long and then uh, we're trying to keep it tight. Um, so, uh, so we're really getting the students sort of jazzed up about, you know, this is important, it's going to go live and people in country will actually use this information, so what you do matters. And if that doesn't get you, then, well, we're, we're grading it and you want it, so we want you to do, do well. And if that doesn't work, then as one of our partners said, puppies may die um, if you do this incorrectly. Um, thank you, Shadrock. Um, uh, so, I mean, you know, trying to emphasize the fact that this, you know, not only does this work matter, but it, it uh, you know, it, it's, it's really, really valuable to the people in country. You're going to make a difference, or at least participating in, in something that makes a difference to people's real lives. So very sort of briefly, the workflow, and Noodle will take us through the workflow a little more thoroughly. Um, first thing we have them do, obviously, is create an uh, OSM account. Most of them have never done this before, so we get them to create an OSM account, and we uh, get them to use ID. ID was what um, had us, uh, gave, gave us the ability to actually introduce us to our intro students. Previously, we used JOSM, and those were with the intermediate GIS students. They already understood concepts of topology and idea of, of digitizing and tracing and whatnot. These newbies are still sort of trying to get their head around the whole geospatial thing. So ID enabled us to uh, really sort of open that up to these new guys. Uh, we need to provide them a tracing guide. And uh, we had a great tracing guide last year from the Geo Center to show them examples specific to the area. And so again, because they're new, a lot of them have never looked at uh, air photo or satellite imagery really, except for what they see on Google Earth. And it's different if you're trying to find um, you know, where the nearest movie theater is as opposed to I need now, need now to trace a building. So I'd, being able to identify that, that building footprint becomes more important. So having something specific to the area is, is key to that. And then we sort of take them through how the work is tasked out and introduce them to tasking manager and identify how they're going to um, 
sort of identify the, and meet their quota and how to um, access testing manager and access, has, access um, sort of the PC geography that they'll be tracing. And then we also show them how we're going to keep track. And Overpass Turbo, if you're not familiar, is a, an open source um, application where you can uh, actually identify all the traces done in a particular piece of geography. It has an open street map. Um, I think we have a screenshot of it coming up. Um, open street map layer there. And so if you put in your tag, because we, we have the um, OSM handles for all of our students, we type in their name, and everything that they've done pops up, or gets highlighted, I should say. So that's how we keep track of it, because it also keeps track of how many edits made, you've made, how many polygons you've made um, within, uh, within open OSM. And then the last thing we like to do is to a, have a mapping, a map, mapping party or a mapathon, which we do, uh, which we make completely optional because it's not during class time. Classes obviously aren't particularly uh, optional, but the mapping party, we keep it fun. We play music, we feed them, and just everybody comes into the lab, bring your laptop, have a good time, and most of the students pretty much knock out the, uh, the vast majority of their assignments uh, during that time. And are, again, lucky because our, our um, our partners come in and uh, and lend a hand and help us um, help us sort of get the students engaged, answering questions, and sort of really work collaboratively. And they seem to enjoy it. All right. Hi everyone. I'm Nula, and I've been working on this with Richard. So very just quickly to go back over the workflow again. We've tried this many different ways, four different times, four completely different iterations, working different softwares together, gridding things out, trying to make the grading for us easier. Last year we think we really figured it out and kind of the, the key to that was uh, these, these items, ID. This was kind of a deal breaker for us in being able to get intro students to do this type of work. Previously we focused on intermediate level students working with JASM, we could trust them, we didn't have to baby them, we were like, okay this would be awesome if it could be the type of instruction you could do in a class that wasn't for geographers. Okay, Take it to another discipline, take it to high school. How can we make this module or this project be something you could bring into any classroom? And ID really, really helped with that. Um, it works, it's intuitive, it's got its own great help document, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And I don't like having to reinvent the wheel, especially when smarter people do it well the first time. So ID, we really, really like that. Um, working with partners that help us develop really good tracing guides, okay? Help, helping us orient the students to the landscape of the area they're working in. Every city or country we've worked in has been a little bit different. You're going to have issues with high, medium and low density areas. The guys at the Geo Center put together a great guide last year looking at the different um, you know, building densities within the city, issues with shadows and what's the protocol if you have buildings with shadows uh, working in areas that were super high density. So this was uh, made available to the students students as part of their training. We have a training class and then all these documents were made available to them online as well so they could go back and read if they had any issues when they were working on this without their instructors. So this really, really helped. So that was another kind of big thing and having the partner develop that with us really helped shift a lot of work off us. Now I know a lot of people are familiar with the tasking manager. Uh, if you're not, it's a, uh, you know, it's um, um, works alongside OSM and administrators or those with administrator act access can set up tasks to be worked on in a, a collaborative <coughs> environment. Now traditionally this would still be a rather dispersed group of volunteers whereas we now have a hundred people jump in on this at the same time. So slightly different model to what it was uh, developed for but it, it still really helped us in what we did because initially we were trying to grid this stuff out in ArcMap and we were making big A3 posters on walls and we were giving students sticky stars that they would put on a, on a cell as soon as they had completed it. So there was a lot of eyeballing and kind of subjective decision to how we got complete. So Tasking Manager was a game changer for us and not everything in it was as we would like uh, in order to assign the, the, the work but we're actually working with these guys to introduce some uh, extra tools that will help us going forward. But just the beauty of them being able to select something out and as you saw already when Richard showed you the rubric that you know they can take an area, they can own that area, they have their quota to exhaust but we grade them on not cherry picking buildings and kind of staying within because what we're aiming for is those hundred people will give us coverage within a city or the part of the city that we're assigned. Okay, So coverage is, is important as hitting those 100 or 200 buildings. So they're graded on that too. 
Um, something else we discovered last year, because we have all these friends that are way smarter than us, and they're like, ooh, have you seen this bit? Have you seen that? So we were like, how are we going to grade this thing again? Because we've just added 70 people to the class that did it last year, and they showed us Overpass Turbo. And if you're not familiar with Overpass Turbo, um, it allows you to, um, it's an API that allows you to query OpenStreetMap data. And we were using it in a very basic sense. We were querying individual student users. So we would send out a Google form, collect all their handles, and then we would use this to extract their data so that we could go back and interact with it and grade it. If they screwed it up, we dinged them and we fixed it. So there was validation built into this process. Not only did we provide the bodies to do the work, we were grading and validating and making that data better. We were guaranteeing a certain quality to the data because of our interaction, okay? And that's what we told our partners when we worked with them. And our students saw us playing around with this and some of them were like, oh, this is cool. Can this tell me how many nodes I've done? Because some people are very protective. They are not going to do one node over 200. So our students have started to use it now um, so they can kind of keep track of how much work they're doing. So they, they found it pretty accessible and it has been updated since last year. So it's actually a little bit even more user friendly for the students that are kind of code frightens them. So, um, so those were some of the, the big things. Something that we ha felt helped a lot were having these map par mapping parties which have become coined as mapathons in our department. First time we rolled this out, I offered it, no actually I didn't offer it, the students asked me could they have one because I made them read up on uh, OSM, they're like, oh, other people have mapping parties, can we have one? And I'm like, you want me to come in on my Friday and map with you? And I'm like, all right, okay, if 20 of you will do it, I'll do it. So 20 of them did it, I bought them pizza and it became really popular. Last year we had over 100 people. We had four classes, we had faculty, faculty spouses, and then people started bringing their friends. So we had this huge event, I did not pay for the pizza last year, somebody else did. Um, we just had you know, music pumping, we had all our LCDs around our lab with Show Me The Way, and we completely took over that thing. I don't know if you're familiar with Show Me The Way, but it, it looks at uh, how edits are going on around the world at a given time. Considering we had so many bodies mapping in one city, pretty much every other um, hit on that thing was our students and they got such a kick out of seeing their names pop up. So it was a really, really good event. We had to kick them out so we could go to the bar at 9.30. But um, yeah, voluntary. And that's what I loved about it. 100 students and I think we had about 97% of them uh, wanted to come to this event and even brought extra people. So what's different from last year because we haven't you know, changed our workflow that much. Um, at this conference last year, a lot of people approached us and they were like, this is kind of cool, I'd like to do this, or my brother's a teacher, he'd like to do this, would you mind sharing your stuff? And I'm like, okay, it's a bit disorganized, but you can have it in the spirit of everything being open, I will totally give you all my slides and stuff. Um, and then we were approached by some other people and said, okay, you need to maybe do this in a more formal way if you're going to share your stuff. So we were approached about putting together a Teach OSM. And Richard and I got a, a small little internal grant from George Washington to support our work on this. And actually part of the, the money for uh, this will also go to um, um, adding some elements to the tasking manager that would actually support uh, instructors when it comes to assigning cells. So rather than people self selecting cells, we can actually assign them to students. So it would help us a bit with that kind of cherry picking and students bouncing around to get to their quota. But Teach OSM will hopefully be a reality by the end of the summer. We're working on it right now. We just got the funding uh, this spring and we just haven't had the opportunity. But it will provide materials uh, that will help instructors to in the identification of an area to work in, how they would potentially assign data to their students, how they manage the project, and indeed how they would grade the project. Um, we hope to provide like, different options for um, basic to advanced workflows, things like demo videos, grading rubrics, and just not have everyone have to start from scratch if they wish to int introduce this to their students. They can basically take all the things that we produce, maybe change them up a little bit depending on what they need and go ahead and have this in the classroom. And we have a few instructors at GW that are kind of willing to be guinea pigs on how well we put this material together. So hopefully coming to a computer near you during the summer. Um, also uh, we had a tiny little bit of money to contribute towards the tasking manager that I featured there and primarily for us it would be 
you know, allowing instructors have uh, the ability to set up tasks, maybe in an educational instance, so we're not kind of polluting the humanitarian, uh, you know, directive that started the original tasking manager. Being able to import KML, so if you have a study area that you set up in a GIS software within Google, being able to import that into into the tasking manager, being able to assign the cells to students, and then things like tagging cells with low, medium, and high density to kind of, you know, ward off the cautious user if they're like, all right, I only need maybe 15 more buildings. I'm not going to jump into this high density area. I'll leave it, excuse me, for something else. And just kind of the parting thing, um, you know, we started this with the notion of a captive crowd, okay? We assigned this for a grade, all right? So students kind of had to do it. I will tell you most of them think it's cool and they enjoy it, but they kind of had to do it, you know? It was, it was like another lab, even though the concept was cool. Um, from this, the students decided they wanted to do more. And as Richard said, that was, you know, we saw that when a week after they finished mapping 16,000 buildings in Kathmandu, they all came back and showed up in their lunchtime and mapped buildings in the Philippines because Hayun hit about a week after we finished the Kathmandu project. They have just chartered a society at GW called the GW Humanitarian Mapping Society. Um, it will be kind of a, a two-tier group where we'll have a base a group trained in OSM that will like that, that they will do regular stuff every month as, as dictated by our partners, and then they will be willing to stand up should a large crisis uh, come into effect, and then train other users that want to help. And we'll also have a GIS core to that group that will actually get trained in some uh, information management skills, and they will be able to support the Red Cross when those guys get deployed. Um, so that's it for us. Our emails are up there, and if anybody has any questions. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really, love the work that you guys are doing. Um, so I'm curious from your perspective if there are other uh, university instructors in the audience, other people who want to take this and do this, what you would like to see other classes do if they were going to build on your own? What are other things that could be taught in the coursework? What are things that you'd like to see maybe explore more? When I formally figure out what I'm doing, I might have time to think about that, Shadrach. You should have told me that 10 minutes ago, and I could have had a very smart answer to that question. I'll be able to answer that at the end of the summer. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Newland, do you have any, uh, or Richard, do you have any thoughts on scaling this to uh, middle school or high school uh, education? I think the idea was if we make it available, we hope that others would use it. We hope to test it a little bit within GW because there's other faculty that want to work with it. There are initiatives within GW that work with high schools and middle schools and once we've kind of cleaned it of its bugs and decide that it's usable, hopefully we'll take it on down to them. So if anyone wants to chat to us afterwards, we'll be available because I know we're kind of tight for time. <laughs>